What I want to talk about to you about today is a particular course that I've developed over a very long time. In fact, it's, it's probably 18 years since the first iteration of this course came into existence. Um, and one of the interesting things is that the course has had its own kind of independent life. Uh, um, that it's at various points converged and diverged with more dominant kind of social projects and languages. And at the moment, it seems interesting to me that the whole question of a kind of decolonial education is being put on the table with a weird sense that that is somehow a new project, where in fact it's a project that's about 60 or 70 years old at least, and in South Africa was very active from the 1980s onwards. Um, and this course comes out of that somewhat longer tradition of um, developing a, a decolonial um, practice um, in education in South Africa. Um, so the, 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 it's essentially an undergraduate course on violence, and what's interesting about it is, I think we recognize that violence is a, a major topical problem in South Africa. It's one of the things people really worry about in their everyday lives and see as a social problem that has a whole lot of not, uh, knock-on effects, not only in terms of personal victimization, but in terms of the harm to the economy and things like that. But the interesting thing is that, it's, uh, that it has never been made into core curriculum in any discipline that I know of. Um, and that in itself, I think, represents part of the kind of a colonial structure of, of our disciplines, that, that the, the focus areas come from other countries that actually are dealing with other problems. So it seemed to me the necessity of dealing with violence um, meant that we, we, we had to develop kind of original curriculum um, on violence, and particularly to, to look at that in terms of a larger project of framing a kind of appropriate... Um, curriculum and ap appropriate teaching methods in South Africa to develop things that actually had some kind of contextual relevance and, and some value for students and application to society. Um, now, immediately offering the idea of violence, the sort of question that is asked from the managerial sp perspective of the university is like, what are the outcomes? Like, and often those outcomes are things uh, thought of in terms of things like employability. Um, and so there, the, the, you know, the, the, the answer was framed in terms of creating expertise. If we need research on, on violence, on the causes of violence, on violence prevention, on policy, on, 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 on better social services. Um, but, but that was never really the interesting part of the course. And in fact, that, 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 one of the interesting transformations is that to the extent to which the, the focus was on developing an area of expertise, that focus actually deteriorated and faded away and got replaced by the second focus, which was also always the major intention of the course, which is to try and create certain kinds of citizens, to try and actually create people who would live in the, in, in the society in a certain way. Um, and that's really important because that gets to the heart of what is kind of radical in the conceptualization of this course is that, that everything about the course, both its, it, it, in its being imagined and its, in, it, in its intentions, um, is about breaking down a fundamental distinction, and what I would argue is a mistaken distinction in our minds, between um, uh, ordinary people and uh, criminals. So what the course does is focus on this work of, of, of bringing into being nonviolent citizens, um, and and it, it, its theoretical founding principles are firstly to, to, to just dismiss this idea that on the one hand there's us normal people just trying to live and be safe in the world, and on the other hand there are these bad criminal people who threaten people and harm them. Um, and, and, and traditionally, within, certainly within fields like criminology, that distinction has operated, but it's operated even more powerfully in the kind of public imagination in, in ordinary people's minds. Um, and linked to that is the idea that what needs to be done about those bad criminals is law enforcement-ish stuff, that they, there needs to be punishment for them. Um, and the course also just totally rejects that as an as a orientation for this set of problems. Instead, what it does is it assumes that everyone is, is caught up in, in violence. Everyone is implicated both as perpetrator and victim.
in different forms of violence. But what is crucial is that they don't know that, that people are not aware of the forms of violence that they are implicated in it and that they are enacting towards other people. And that most of the harm that people do to each other is not done out of a sadistic desire to derive pleasure from harming people. It's not even done in order to coerce people into um, uh, giving you their property. It's done in kind of ignorant, unthinking, unrecognized ways. Um, and so that's fundamental to the conceptualization of, of, of violence in this course. Um, linked to that, um, is the idea that what the course is really about is, is, is about learning to think critically in certain ways. So in one sense, even the topic of violence is a pretext for a generalized skill of critical thinking. Um, and it just happens to be a particular focus uh, site of, of trying to develop those skills. So that means that the traditional project of, of, of making students aware of the research findings in the field becomes a secondary project. And what becomes much more interesting is looking at the competing um, frameworks for explaining uh, what violence is and how it works. Um, once again, having said that, it's also important to say that the aim of, of, sort of, of offering um, these different frameworks is not to work out which one is right, which is the traditional way of doing things, is to have a sort of a, a, a trajectory of, of, of old, failed um, explanatory systems being improved over time until we get to the best possible one. That, that, that's not the kind of intellectual work being done here. It's rather to focus on those explanations and look at the work they do. Um, so not so much trying to find the right one as trying to find out what happens when you commit yourself to a particular way of thinking um, and what are the consequences of that. Not only intellectually, but in terms of kind of social practice, even in terms of the identity you create for yourself. Um, and as soon as we start doing that, it raises a really fundamental question at, at the core of this course is, is, is what, what is violence? Like what, what are we talking about when we talk about something uh, um, as violent? Um, and how do we know that? And that becomes a critical question. How do we know what things are violent and what things aren't? And that's a very counterintuitive qu question because everyone assumes they already know that you could, you, if there's one thing you can tell, it's whether someone's being violent towards you. In fact, the assumption in this course is that that's, that, is not, that, is, that is not as visible. Um, now, pedagogically, the course is really caught up um, in uh, certain kinds of uh, teaching and learning process. And one of those processes is the integration of participant literacies. That one of the, the critiques that's come out very strongly in the, in the last year or two is the way in which higher education um, uh, teaching uh, doesn't gel with, particularly with people from disadvantaged um, uh, backgrounds, that the, the modes of teaching and the modes of learning don't synchronize particularly well. And so one of the things this, this course is really interested in is, is to say, well, what are the, the literacies, um, what are the thinking strategies that people already have and already bring in with them into the room? Um, and the first thing is that, that part of the point of focusing on violence is because people already feel strongly about it, that, that people live with the question, how can I be safe? Um, and it's a question that, that even if they don't consciously formulate it to themselves, they, they're managing that question all the time. Um, and so um, the, the course really just frames that question openly, um, and it looks at... Um, uh, a whole lot of, of, of materials, non-academic materials, that people are already using uh, to, to think, like uh, conversations, news reports, uh, TV series, things like that. Um, and it shows how, how, how all of those kinds of, of, of um, ways of thinking, all of those representations, are already shaping what people think violence is and what they think the solutions are. Um, what the course does then is integrate all of those materials at the same level as the traditional academic theoretical materials and presents them as a set of competing theories. What, it, what it's possible to do then is, is, is not to just take those, the, those theories as, as, as um, possible equal alternatives, but to look at them uh, to try and understand how people's existing everyday thinking has been assembled, how, the, how it's come into being. Um, and then to allow them to ask questions about that. Um, so 
here we get to the real core of the course. And this is something that I hadn't consciously um, clarified to myself when I started developing the course, but it can be much more clear as a, as a core project of the course. Is that the course is about transformation. It's, a, it's about this question of how do you create people who will create a non-violent society. Um, and so by identifying how ordinary thinking is assembled, um, we are able to make it the, 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 the subject of the critical examination in the course and uh, enable people to, to say, well, where do their ideas of things come from? Why do they believe them? And then more importantly, how do those uh, versions, how do those explanations um, affect how people think, how they act, how they feel about experiences, wh what kind of identity they construct for themselves? and particularly how this affects their relationship between them and other people and their social groups and other social groups. Um, and then we are able to move into the more traditional question of what happens when we compare that to the um, established bodies of research evidence. Uh, what happens when we compare those accounts to the um, competing uh, academic theoretical accounts that, that try to be more inclusive. Um, and so to evaluate the different um, the different versions based on the evidence and competing theories, but also then to ask the a, a third really important question is what are the consequences of thinking with these different perspectives? Um, um, and this, this process of, of, of asking about that and, and, and of creating the possibilities of, of, of entering into different perspectives is actually a process of creating different kinds of people. Um, and this may seem kind of abstract. So, I want to give you an example, but it means I'm not going to finish my slides. Uh, recently, the High Court uh, ruled that corporal punishment is incompatible with the Constitution. Okay, um, that uh, that you can't hit your kids if they're naughty, and this just freaks South Africans out because you have to discipline your kids, otherwise they'll grow up to become criminals. That's a dominant account. That's exactly what I mean by a, the, a, an assumption about something being violent or nonviolent. Hitting your kids in order to regulate their behavior is not seen as violent by about 94% of South Africans. Um, all the research um, that's been done in the last 60 years internationally shows that it is, and that it has very, very specific detrimental harmful effects both to the children themselves and to the society as a whole. Nevertheless, ordinary people raising their kids don't think hitting them is violent and think that hitting them will prevent them becoming people who are, have no respect for law and order and other people and things like that. So that, that gives you an example of the kind of conceptual tension. Um, by shifting that perspective, by allowing the possibility of a different perspective, a whole lot of, of things get triggered. Um, uh, firstly, the recognition that you may be being a perpetrator of violence without knowing it. Secondly, um, recognizing that you may have been a victim of violence in a way that you didn't know, which then triggers a whole lot of other things. It triggers processes of grief and rage, um, and, 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 and it creates a different kind of person who may interact with people differently and may contribute differently to the cycles of violence in society. So that, that's one example of probably 20 or 30 different things that we look at. Where we, where, where we engage kind of common sense traditions, different ways of thinking with the different perspectives. The, um, the thing I want to talk about, though, is the question of risks, because teaching this course is dangerous in a particular way, because it does two things. Firstly, the, the overwhelming focus on just reading about the horrible things people do makes the world seem depressing and terrifying. Secondly, specific issues trigger people, people who are survivors of sexual violence, of child abuse, things like that. It, it, it becomes very overwhelming for them. So one of the core processes in the course then becomes how we deal with that. Because the normal sort of managerial instinct is to say, well, you mustn't do that because it's dangerous. And yet we must do that. And this is what um, some of my colleagues are going to raise as well, because that is at the core of the transformational process. Um, so, so rather than avoid those risks, what we do is try and integrate them positively in, in the learning process. And it's interesting how simple things like giving people words and concepts for experience actually makes things manageable in a way that they aren't if they haven't been um, if provided with those things. You know, like just like having a hashtag like Me Too makes people reflect on experiences they've had in the workplace. Um, completely differently from what, how they might have. 
and it both makes those experiences more painful, but also places them in a kind of a social solidarity, which 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 means that they, they can be resisted and challenged and become part of a of a of a system of social change. So I really want to identify how how those kinds of processes are critical in work, um, and then just to end. Um, in fact, I don't really want to talk about the decolonial elements. I want to leave it with that because we're out of time, and that's obvious. You can infer it yourself. Okay. Yeah.